few questions. And the first one will be about the origin of Clanlands, because I understood that it was supposed to be a podcast and, and then it was turned into a TV show and then it was turned mm. into a book. So, so how mm. did this whole idea come to you? Um, the book uh, kind of came after we did our first road trip. So we did our first road trip in September of 2019. And we were, um, we, we basically did it as a kind of uh, a, a, a calling card for stars and Sony and say to them, look, this is what we've done. Uh, would you be interested in making this into a show with us? Which is what we did. Um, but the experience of doing the first road trip, which was really done over a period of weekends between filming, uh, we, we sort of ran around the, the, the Scottish countryside meeting these extraordinary people. And early in 2020, very early in 2020, um, we approached a publisher um, about making it into a book, that first experience. So the book really deals primarily with our first road trip. Whereas the TV series, Men in Kilts, is, um, has some of the elements of the first road trip in it, some, of, some footage, but mostly it's from the second road trip. So really there's a kind of overlap between the two. You have, um, you have Clan Lands, uh, which really goes into a lot more detail as well about the experience and obviously more detail about the history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and also strays into areas of, you know, our personal life, our careers um, outside of Outlander and doing the road trip, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but the TV show, uh, was originally, uh, this was early 2019. Um, Sam and I had always been interested in doing uh, something together. And he rang me and said, listen, you know, uh, are you still interested in doing something about Scotland? And I said, yes. Um, and then he said, uh, uh, why don't we do a podcast? And I pretended to know what a podcast was. I had no idea, really. So I went, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then he rang me like two days later and said, why don't we, don't, why don't we film it? Why don't we, uh, why don't we like, use GoPros? Um, and sit with each other with GoPros. And I was like, no, I don't really know how that's going to work because, you know, what am I going to put it on my head and you're going to have one on your head and it's going to look a bit weird. Uh, and then he said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's do it with the full crew. And suddenly we had three cameras, a drone, um, and a full, you know, sound and makeup and all the rest of it. And um, we, we took this very dysfunctional group of people on the road with us in, I think it was about three or four separate vehicles and rode, drove all around Scotland. And it was very quick. It happened very, very quickly. We really, when, when I think, I think that was March, 2019. And when you think that by September, 2020, we had, uh, we'd done the first road trip. We'd sold the show to Stars and Sony. We'd written the book. It was just about to be published. And we had done a second road trip and filmed Men Kills. So basically in the space of 18 months, we, we, we it, it all suddenly just <laughs> happened. So, yeah. yeah, it became Bizarre. a big thing quite quickly. It, it, yes, it kind of, um, well, once Sony and Stars came on board, I mean, then you've got the whole um, machine of a, of a television network and a studio behind you to actually, we had a company called Boardwalk Productions that came on board. They, um, they did the logistics of it. They worked out the schedule and blah, 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 all the rest of it, who we were going to be seeing. And then really it was, only, it was just up to, we, we, we um, were part of the decision-making on all of that. But then it really became just me and Sam turning up um, in September, uh, sorry, August of 2020 and, uh, and filming it and meet, meeting these people and trying to keep it as spontaneous and uh, unscripted as possible. Well, it was completely unscripted, but uh, yeah, that's what we were very keen to keep that element of fresh kind of surprise. Uh, for us as much as for anybody watching. And at what 
really is your personal history with Clan Nance because I, I remember you saying in the book that you had this idea since the 90s and that you had yeah. the, in the documentary. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I wrote a treatment um, called Clan Lands in 1991, um, long time before you were born. Uh, <laughs> And uh, 1991, um, and the idea was, I've, I've always been interested in Scottish history and the clan structure and the, the constant feuding and the, for, for a country as small as Scotland, um, there's just an enormous amount of fighting that's gone on. I mean, they've just centuries of it. And so I, I was always interested in that. And um, in those days, you know, you didn't have streaming platforms and all the rest of it so it was the idea was to make separate films about each clan and have dvds of them and then contact directly expatriate scots living in wherever america canada new zealand australia and say hey if you're interested in your clan here's a here's a dvd about them <coughs> and i was going to do all this filming very similar to clan lands or oh, many kills you know drone shots, landscapes, interviewing people and all the rest of it. But nobody was interested in 1991, nobody was interested. And so it kind of lay dormant for the best part of 30 years. And, uh, but I guess the moral of the story is, um, you know, never, never completely abandon an idea because you never know when it will actually Well, how, how would you describe Clanlands? Because it is, the book describes it as a Scottish adventure, but it's not, it's not really a novel. It's not really no. a travel guide. It's not really a history book. So no, I characterize it more as a conversation, really, mm. between me and Sam. Because um, we wrote it uh, during lockdown. Uh, so I was here and he was in Scotland and we would have these Google documents where I'd be writing away and at sometimes literally in real time, he would be writing as well. So you'd see his cursor come up and he'd start to write something and, and it would be disagreeing with something that I'd said or saying that that didn't happen or vice versa. And I would, I would be tap, tapping away. And, and so it really quite naturally went into this conversational mode um, where we were just not, an, not exactly an argument, but more like um, two different perspectives on the same experience, I suppose, is really how, uh, and that incorporates, and we, we, we go down little tangents, I suppose. We're talking about whatever, and that will remind us of, oh, and I remember doing that, and off we go down that little rabbit hole, and then we come back. Um, so it's really, um, yes, a conversational stream of consciousness is, uh, the only way I can think of to describe it, really. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't, um, yeah, we didn't think, oh yes, we need to, we need to do this. And I think, you know, if, if the book has any uh, merit, I think it's, th it's that really, that it isn't like the other genres you described. It's not, you know, if you want to get a travel book about Scotland, there are plenty of travel books. But this is really a, a very personal experience that's um, laid out for readers to, to go along with. So they share the journey, I suppose. Yeah. And, and so how did you find the experience of writing? Because, I mean, it, it is already difficult normally, but writing with someone else and on mm. different, different countries as well. Yeah. Yeah, weirdly enough, it, it actually wasn't too bad. Um, we, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I mean, at first, it seemed like this monumental task because we actually had quite a, a quick, uh, we had a, a deadline that was coming up pretty quickly. Um, we started writing it in, well, effectively, the beginning of April, end of March. And then we had April, May and June. We had about three, th four months, four months to do the whole thing. And... Um, the lockdown helped hugely, it really did, because it completely, there was nothing else to do. Uh, we were just stuck in our respective places and uh, every day we'd get up and blah, 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 do our thing. But I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the, um, 
Um, I mean, my, I don't know, I can't speak for Sam, but the way I do it is I really just take a, an idea or a, an incident and then uh, I just start writing. I, I, I don't really make many notes. Um, I, it's very much uh, what occurs to me at the time. So hopefully that adds to the, um, the spontaneous feel because it, it is. Uh, it's it's really just what's what's in my head at that moment about about an experience that Sam and I shared, um, and um, I, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did, and I, and Sam did too. He really loved it. Yeah. And what what was very interesting is that we don't really see Scotland as. Or well, we don't really talk about Scotland in a European context generally, the history of Scotland. And what I thought was really interesting with, for example, the Jacobite Revolt of 1745 or mm. the history of Charles Church in general is really his mm. ties with the Mediterranean, which is yeah, yeah. Really at the core of our society. Yeah. And mm. um, how that really all blended together in the dark about revolution with the Spanish help, which didn't reach Scotland in the end, all the French troops, yeah. which did not either. And I thought that was really interesting because we don't really see Scotland like this normally. Well, Scotland, uh, certainly, well, certainly from a British perspective, has always been seen as just this kind of add-on to, to England, essentially. And uh, when you start seeing that period from a Scottish perspective, it's very, very different. I mean, they, uh, you know, when you think the Act of Union was only 1703, or whatever, yeah, 1703, um, really not that long ago, and that Scotland had been an independent kingdom for hundreds of years. Uh, and they saw themselves very much, I think, in a broader European context. Um, certainly their relationship with France was very strong um, and had been for, for some time because really you know to put it bluntly they they shared a common enemy which was england um that was it really uh, i don't think there was necessarily a, an overwhelming love of french culture or vice versa i, I think it was um that they they saw uh, that there was an advantage to to working together and having said that as i think we talk in the book um S scottish clan chiefs, war chiefs, people like Dougal Mackenzie, uh, would have traveled extensively in Europe. They, they would have, you know, they would have been to Rome. They would have, they would have been to France. They would have spoken those languages probably. Uh, and so I think um, it, it's good to see that Scotland wasn't this sort of, I, I, I think the general perception of the Highlands of Scotland in the lead up to the Jacobite rebellion is a bunch of sort of savages sort of running around the heather, um, really not knowing what they're doing. But they were actually quite a sophisticated group of people. They were very isolated. And that's the other thing to remember historically about the Highlands. Uh, it was just a very difficult place to get to. Uh, there was essentially only one way in by land, which was around Stirling. Um, and the rest of the time it was by sea. And so most of the most of the Highland clans, especially in the Western part of the Highlands, moved around by, by boat. They didn't move around on land. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about, about Scotland. I, I knew quite a bit beforehand, but it's um, really that whole, the, the relationship between the different clans and and how they would quite literally go from uh, an, an alliance, a marriage, to war, to feuding, to killing the wife, to then, you know, having the rest of the family come and try and slaughter them, uh, that would go on for, you know, 150 years. Uh, it was, um, you know, when, when I think about the Highlands, I don't think about people sitting around quietly enjoying a, a peaceful life. <laughs> I just, I really do see them as, people that were just taking slight pauses between um, mass slaughter. Uh, you know, 
<laughs> they were, they loved fighting. They loved it. And the, the, the Highland troops that England, or Britain, if you want to call it that, um, absorbed into the British army post Culloden were the backbone of what led to the British Empire, essentially. Uh, that Scotland, the, the Highlanders were used because they recognized um, the, the, the ferocity of those people. They were used as uh, shock troops, really, um, in, uh, in conquering other parts of the world. And, you know, I think you can definitely look at Culloden and that pivotal moment in history as a fork in the road when Scotland could have taken the road of being much much more insular, this sort of independent land, much more um, much more about agriculture and uh, and England would have been kind of stuffed because they wouldn't have been able to expand abroad. There were wars with Europe that would have been severely compromised. Um, you can definitely argue that uh, the the taxes. Now, what was this? This was the taxes. Um, Yes, because it then allowed Britain to make war in Europe, the, the, um, the victory at Culloden, because it allowed Britain to make war in Europe, they needed to raise taxes for that war. And the raising of the taxes was the thing that essentially precipitated the American Revolution. Uh, it, was the, it, was, it was that. And the objection of the, the Americans to paying ta those taxes that were funding a war in Europe. And that led to um, the independence of the United States and to the world that we live in now. So you can, you can, you know, it's not a huge leap or an exaggeration to say all roads lead back to Culloden yeah. to that day in April in 1746. But if, if the Jacobites had won, the world would definitely be very different.